And we're live. Welcome back to yet another episode of the Blasters and Blades podcast. All right, I tried to do the movie trailer voice, and it just came across like somebody who smoked one too many crack pipes. So we'll just move on. Hey, all you crazy sci-fi and fantasy fans, it's time for your daily dose of shenanigans over here at the Blasters and Blades podcast. Just three nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions and fantastical fantasies. A place where magic is king, the sky is the limit, and space is the place. We are the podcast that puts the fun in dysfunction. So without further ado, you've been on the show too many times, Miss Stabby, and you have never answered the religion question. And today is the day we will fix that. You ready for this? Let's go. Can you do this? All right. First off, let's do this right. There's no hiding behind Nick. We got you. All right. Now that we got that out of the way, Star Wars, Star Trek, or Firefly? Star Wars. Okay. Why? Defend your answer, madam. (laughs) Defend your answer. Star Wars. Period. There's there's nothing else. Star Trek's okay. I've never seen Firefly, so it's Star Wars. All right, Nick, we're going to have to do an episode where we break down Star uh, Firefly, and she's going to have to watch it. You have just volunteered yourself for that episode, madam. 16 episodes. Let's do this. All right. And because we're polytheistic, are you ready for this? You ready? All right, question. Game of Thrones, The Wheel of Time, or Lord of the Rings? I know you like the darkness, so I'm, I'm guessing I know what your answer is going to be. She's never seen Lord of the Rings. I've never seen Lord of the Rings. I don't know what the Holy other Holy hell. Is. Nick, so, you have failed her as her husband. Every time I put it on, she falls asleep. <laughs> okay, that's valid. I get bored. I fall asleep. <laughs> I'm like, you can play with your iPad while we watch it, like we do everything else. Gotta go house Targaryen here. Sorry. <laughs> Are you a darkness, the Game of Thrones? I knew you were a dark person. You're a resident I'm horror person. I'm part of the Night's Watch, so. All right, and because uh, we're doing a little bit of episode, if you read the title, this is the Indiana Jones in the Dial of Destiny movie review. So first, we're going to introduce the episode, and because we threw out the script, I'm not going to get too persnickety. I'm just going to show you the trailer real quick. You ready? Yes. What are you doing here? I miss waking up every morning. Wondering what wonderful adventure the new day will bring to us. Those days have come and gone. Perhaps not. She's like you. Very much like you. Where is she? Never guess. Who is this man? I'm her godfather. Get back. All right, we didn't need to watch that little exit scene. Um, so obviously, for anybody that's getting persnickety, that was fair use. Uh, we are covered by the uh, the laws of the land. We would not violate copyright here laws at the Black the Good sir. The the laws first, the uh, I did like the inversion because this is you know I'm coming. I haven't watched the movie yet. I don't do theaters mostly because my pocketbook doesn't allow it right now. Um, right, but I, I did like. Work. I, I hear you got to mortgage your firstborn and sell your liver to uh, to afford a movie ticket these days. The liver's a steal because <laughs> that thing's <is> right. <laughs> that is true. Uh, they, they might charge me to take the liver at this point. No, um, they're like, how's your kidney feeling? I'm like, I don't know. It's okay, I guess. <laughs> so I did like, so in one of the iconic scenes of Indiana Jones, the guy's waving his swords and then he pulls out his pistol and shoots him. Right. Yeah. Which is even funnier because that was never how the script was supposed to be. He was just tired at the end of the day. Harrison Ford had diarrhea that day. Yeah. (laughs) He needed some Pepto Bismol. They should use that in a commercial. Yeah. Um, uh, Maybe they'll sponsor us after this little plug. But, uh, and then they inverted it in this trailer uh, with him waving around the the whip that was iconic to his character and then everyone else pulling out the guns. And that was such a fun scene, too. And uh, and it really plays on. the whole premise of the movie. They're really playing to his age. Right. Like, he, 
like even Indy knows that he's an old dude, you know, it's like everything hurts. And that's also another part of the movie is that he's, he's there's a lot of callbacks to the, uh, you know, the, the earlier films, you know, and it really plays to his age. Like I said, you know, so it's like everything hurts <laughs> and she's laughing the whole time from the, as soon as they show Indy and he's like passed out drunk in a, in a recliner with a glass of whiskey in his hand. Boxers all twisted boxers up. Boxers all, tw <laughs> boxers, shorts all twisted up. You know, he gets up, he starts moving around and she's laughing. I'm like, what the hell are you laughing at? She goes, that's you. Oh, I'm like, it's not, it's not the age, it's the mileage. So, I mean, that's just harsh Jerry. though. No, that's not what he says. So, yeah, it's, um, yeah, this one more than uh, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull felt like a, a classic indie adventure. You know, with Indiana Jones, you're going to deal with the fantastical, the strange, the larger than life. Um, usually, has to deal with religious objects. Um, this one deals with a uh, no, not really a religious. Was it Alchemies mm -hmm. built it? So they're dealing with like early Greek stuff. Time travel. Oh yeah, time travel. So. I mean, why so, not? First off, let's 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 do the the start. Do you feel like the trailer that's out there, and that was the main one, and the first one they launched? Do you feel like the trailer did an adequate job of showing the movie? Yeah, I think the the trailer showed just enough to get you, you know, to pique your interest, but it didn't really give too much away. Even the uh, scene where it looks like the, I mean, if you if you just catch it, they're in a plane. And they're in like a, a World War II uh, German bomber, and the very front of it is almost looks like the front of, at least from the cockpit, looks like the Millennium Falcon, and they're going through like a whole bunch. It, it almost looked like they were going in hyperspace. So that caught my eye, and I was like, "Oh wow, shit! What are they doing?" <laughs> All right, so let's uh, let's not bury the lead. There was lots of talk on both sides of the political aisle. Um, that hated this movie for different reasons. It was either too misogynistic, not misogynistic enough, too political, not political. There is a trend right now in Hollywood, looking at you, Star Wars, where they take the heroes, the iconic people we knew and love. Okay, let's get the uh, Andy screen off and we'll let you guys take center stage. There is a trend in some Hollywood movies, and, and Star Wars did it horribly, where they take the characters we know and love, they butcher them, they emasculate them, even the women, and they make them shells of who they used to be in order, like I get to a point, they need to usher in the new age of people. Those actors are getting older. Some of them aren't alive anymore. I get the need to introduce new people. I just don't think you have to do it in a way that destroys the iconic person that these characters were. Yeah. I feel like yeah. Indy got the uh, Star Wars treatment or was he treated fairly uh, trying to branch out in this franchise. He was treated fairly. There were bits. There were bits where um, the female lead was really, you know, I'm an independent woman. I don't need your help. Go away. Leave me alone. I can handle this. And the next thing you know, she's being saved by Indy. So yeah. it's it's one of those things where you're, for a minute there, you're like, really, you're going to do Indy like that? And then all of a sudden, he's there to save the day again. Yeah. But I, I, I yeah, with the bubble gum. The bubble gum. <laughs> yeah, I, I think he was treated quite fairly. Um, they did kind of hit you with a head fake, you know, like she said, where you know the strong independent woman, because this takes place in the '60s after the Apollo missions. Okay. So just, Andy's been around for a long damn time, you know, because his first adventure was in 1932, mm -hmm. and he was a kid in the early teens with his dad. Yeah, yeah, in Utah. Um, yeah, we actually, it's like I'm a huge Indiana Jones fan. And she brought up, I was like, how do we not own any, any Indiana Jones any Indy props, anything? And I'm like, oh, crap. And I'm like, well, probably because the majority of my life has been focused on Star Wars and comic books. So we're, I do we're, remember there was a computer Indiana Jones game. Yeah. You got to steal a sub on the computer. That was a fun game. I just remember liking stealing the sub and just driving around and doing nothing with it. And then there was the arcade game in the, um, I want to say it was like the late eighties. Um, and all you, it was based off of temple of doom. Okay. So all, all you really did was jump onto railroad, the uh, little mining carts and like try to knock other people off the bad guys that were coming after you. And then every so often you'd stop and you'd 
go through like some side scrolling stuff. And then you're, it was all just to get to the next mine cart. So nice. I mean, that one. Iconic tech uh, games. Uh, some of them didn't age so well. I remember playing the Atari at my grandma's house, and then I got an emulator for the TV with all the old Atari, Atari games to try to get yeah. my kids. Like, this slice of my childhood, and then I hit play. And I'm like, these games suck. <laughs> <laughs> We've been spoiled. We've, yeah. um, an open world indie game would be awesome. I'd be a big. I would. Well, it's that. funny that like we keep bouncing back and forth between Star Wars and Indiana Jones because I actually saw Indiana Jones first. Oh, okay. And um, my nobody in my family likes Star Wars. Nobody. I'm the only one, and it was actually on behest of my blockbuster member. That was like, hey, if you like Indiana Jones, you like Harrison Ford, you might like this. And he handed me Star Wars for the I mean, if they don't like the original Star Wars, is it also true that they're um, card-carrying members of the American Communist Party? I'm just asking. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> we, we're not political here. That was a joke, people. We all grew up in the Cold War. That was a thing. You kill a commie for your mommy, all right? We get okay. it. Yeah. Kill a red till they're dead, you know? <laughs> and the, uh, the iconic line from Full Metal Jacket, I guess the Commandant and the Commies don't get theirs. Yep. <laughs> I probably butchered that quote, but it's been a few years. We should go yeah. back and start reviewing some of the classic movies from like the 80s and 90s. Yeah, we need to do... Uh, well, they kind of brought that up in the last indie Retro movie. reviews. Indie movie. Which one? Uh, the Crystal Skull. Oh, yeah, because that's the only indie movie that had Russians in it, had communists in it. He, he cracked a joke about that when he was being investigated for surviving an atomic blast. Okay, so we'll get back on track because the the danger of the new scriptless approach is we can go far afield. And Apparently, people like our insane rabbit trails, so I mean, I guess they're here for it. But I'll try to I'll try to herd the cats on this one. All right, well, focus on Dial of Destiny. That's what we're Dial of Destiny. So first off, you watched it in the theater. What yes. was the theater experience like? Was it worth the surround sound and the popcorn at twenty dollars a pop? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think so. We don't do popcorn though. All right, well, what's your favorite snack for the movie? I mean, if we're going to do the movie review, we got to go full. I get a Bavarian pretzel with it's nacho cheese. It's big. What's a Bavarian pretzel? Okay, educate it's me. It's big. It's this it's big. big. Like the fish it's icon. Like, they put it in a medium pizza box. That's how big this freaking is. It's just is. a giant pretzel. It's like. That must be a, like a California thing because, I mean, we don't even have real food unless you go to like a cinema cafe where they do the old movies that are coming like right before they go to the DVD. No, I, I, they off, offered something similar in uh, St. Augustine when I went and saw The Flash. Okay. The Flash All right, so, so what's your snack of choice? Bavarian pretzel. What do you drink when you're watching a movie? Uh, large spark root beer. All right, what I about you, Stabby? I do nachos, and our, um, our movie has theater has a bar, and they do uh, themed drinks. So every movie we go see, I typically get the theme drink, and this time it was made with Hennessy, and that's not my that's not my jam. That's how Stabby becomes a Stabby, and um, so I went with a root beer this time. Yeah. So the last time I saw a movie in the theater that I didn't just wait for it to come out on DVD was Last of the Mohicans. So it's been a little bit, yes. and uh, I watched that in the Second Chance Theater. Otherwise, no, it was the what's that? <laughs> You know that movie's over 30 years old, right? I mean, like, I know I couldn't drive yet, so it was... It's been over 30 years since you've seen a movie in the theater? Yeah. Come visit me. I'll, I'll, pay, I'll, pay. I'll pay for your ticket, man. That's or we can do the drive-in. I okay. want to go to a drive-in. That is on my bucket list. To There's one in Northern Virginia, I'm told. There's one right around the corner from our house, right next to the Denny's. Road trip. You think we could business expense that? Oh, Any of our tax right. consultants that are listening, you tell us whether we can make that a thing. Show notes, man. We'll go see a movie that because we're gonna do movie review on it. Boom. Anyways. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna start doing. I think I think we've decided we're gonna do retro movie reviews, yeah. uh, so we can watch some of the classics, uh, and we'll start. Uh, maybe if any of our our listeners are fans of the show that enjoy a good movie or a good book, if you want to do reviews with us, I mean, like you don't have to be an author to get on the show. You just have to be nerdy with us. Yeah. Um. So nerdy. so all right. So you go in, you do the, the the Bavarian pretzel and the nachos, Bart's root beer. Will you stomach oh, A and W if that's the uh, if that's the option, or is it Bart's or nothing? No, because it's one of those Coke machines that got like ninety million flavors, and I get overwhelmed. Okay. So let's go so, with root beer. So let's just go with root beer or Dr. Got, Pepper. Or or Dr. Pepper. 
Do you let your inner 12 year old out and just put a little bit of everything? No, no, no. no. Actually, I get after the boy about that. He, he does the... He's like, but it's good. And I'm like, no, because I was your age when I used to do that dumb stuff. And I convinced myself that it was good. I tried it again as an adult and I was like, no, this is crap. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I also had a mullet because I convinced myself that it was good. Like, no, no. Yeah. Some things we just need the parents to tell us no. Yeah, that when I grow a mustache, it's just... I try to grow a beard and I look like the Unabomber and I was like, no, nope, got to shave it. It's just... Got to get you the... The, the, big, the big sunglasses and the hoodie. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I can't go for a walk when I've got my beard because at, at night, like I'm telling you, the cops are going to be like, uh-oh, we got him. The Unabomber's back. It's, so it's one of my best friends in Texas, he's uh, Indian from India. He immigrated here when he was nine. Um, when he started growing out his beard, it was really looking very 9-11-y. Yeah. So like right. when we, we'd go on our strolls, we'd walk our dogs together and people would like, you know, whisper like, oh my God, look at that terrace. And he looks at him and just serious as a heart attack, looks at him and goes, no. And, and in an Indian accent, which he doesn't, he has to fake it because he lost it years ago. He's like, no, 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 no. We're the 7-Eleven people, not the 9-Eleven people. <laughs> I'm over there trying to fucking hold a laugh in. Oh. He's a heart attack because I was, oh man, I was, as soon as they left, I was, I was on the ground laughing. Dog was looking at me like, like, what happened? Do you have a heart attack? Like, was, just, oh. was he military? No. Because I noticed the people that I served with, or just served in general, we tend to have irreverent senses of humor that sometimes offend the normies. No, he's from Ohio. So I think it's almost like living in that state. No offense. Well, to I mean, him. Ohio is the state that has more astronauts than any other because they'd Ohio. rather leave the planet than live in Ohio. They would, they, if Elon Musk goes, hey, would you rather stay in Ohio or I'll pay for you to go to Mars? What would you do? I would say almost all of them are like, I'll go to Mars. You say, I will build a, a capsule for you to live on the sun. And I bet they take that too. Yeah, probably. Well, I mean, my sister was born and raised in Ohio and she now lives in Las Vegas. So, and she constantly so that's talks basically about like Ohio. lives. In the sun. That's basically like living on the sun, living in Nevada. Yeah, pretty much. It was like 122 the other day. Oh, God, it's too hot. I know, like, uh, my, my idea of purgatory is like Nevada or Arizona weather, where yes. like they just, you go there to be convinced of all your sins. Um, I was born and raised in Vegas. I got used to the heat. I used to give him so much crap because he'd be like, it was 80 degrees today. I'm sweating now so look bad. Now it's look so hot. Three years out here. I cannot do Vegas anymore. And you know, I constantly tell him, I'm like, babe, it's too hot today. I'm sweating. It's like it's only 77 degrees outside. The the, the best is, and we, we do it to all the newcomers uh, in the Virginia, it's Southern right. Virginia area. It's not so much the heat. It's the humidity that gets you. And it's true, but you yeah, sound like a total that. prick to them every time you tell them that. Yeah. As they're dying of humidity. It's not the heat. It's the humidity. Like, well, that's I would say Vegas. Virginia and northern florida coastal oh, florida is pretty Louisiana. much uh just sticky i had an aunt that lived in orlando and i went out there to mow her yard it's worse in florida i remember i had just taken a shower i got up and she's like hey do you mind mowing the yard i think i was like 14 or 15 i'm like sure i'll mow the yard i walked out and by the time i was done mowing her tiny yard i'm like it's i like looked like i had showered with my clothes on yeah because i was just drenched it's it's oh, horrible yeah. It's yeah, because it's like ninety-seven percent humidity, and like, and if you did it during the summer, it's at least ninety degrees outside. So you got like so, so you get a, breathe it. Abby doesn't know this, but we, uh, you and I, wrote a short story together that's in the sponsor of this episode, which is Zombies Patient Zero. Our yep. short story was set on an alien planet that was inspired by Florida and the weather yes. there. Because you had been there for your training, and I remember spending the summer there. So I took. Spanish in middle school and high school. And we thought since my uncle's from Guatemala, I'll just go live with him for the summer and just speak nothing but Spanish. I, I still can't roll my R's. Uh, I switched to German because you just got to sound angry and like you want to spit on somebody. And yeah. Do, I took work in German in high school. Yeah. So I tried that. But while I was there, it's just the heat. I'm just, I still have vivid memories of that torture. You can tell someone you love them in German sounds hostile. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and you could say like three words and it sounds like 12 just because of all the. The hyphens and stuff, but uh, okay. it's like, whoa, dude, I was just <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, so back, back to Dial of Destiny. All right, so it's got a lot of um flack from people that want to involve everything in the culture war. Sometimes a movie's just a movie, a cigar is just a yeah. cigar. So, what right. is your take? Like, uh, 
anybody that follows you on social media knows you have a certain religious Catholic perspective. Uh, I'm pretty laissez-faire libertarian. We don't talk about it because we don't care here on the show. This is politically free zone. Um, so with that being said, as a disclaimer, did you feel like you were being attacked? No. Did you feel like they were attacking the other side or was it pretty middle of the road? No, I think because they brought back Nazis, man. Yeah. You know, so no matter what your political ideology is or how you like in today's spectrum, everybody loves Indiana Jones kicking the ass of Nazis. Everybody. Okay. And and they brought that back. So like the beginning of the movie starts during World War II when Indy was a colonel in the OSS. So that's how it starts off. Okay. So did they have a, a stand-in or did they somehow de No, they, uh, um, they did that like reverse aging thing, that CGI thing they do. How, how did that look uh, from a, like it an artistic really it was It was pretty seamless. Like you couldn't even tell that it was CGI. It, how I, much of that was flashbacks to existing movie fo footage? Oh, probably all of it. Because okay. you got to think of how many hours of footage they have of Harrison Ford from that time time era, you know? Yeah. So, and with the advancements in AI, they just they scan every little angle and all that stuff, and they're just able to graft it right over the actor, which was probably Harrison Ford because, you know, he probably wore dots on his face. And, you know, um, they tried to, like, uh, I don't even know, not euthanize, because that's a different that's a different thing altogether. Um, they tried to make his voice de-age his voice, but that really didn't work because, like, you can tell it's Harrison Ford, but you, you know it's, like, current Harrison Ford. It's very gruff, you know? Even in the original indies, he had a, a gravelly kind of voice. He did. Yeah, but, like, his voice is really gravelly now. Like, okay. it's like, huh? It's all yeah. whiskey. It is all the whiskey, so... As for the whole political aspect, I mean, they didn't really do too much of it. There was a lot of, I'm an independent woman, I don't need help. Um, they touched on the hippies a little bit. They touched on the hippies a little bit. And then you had the um, the lead FBI agent was an African-American woman. Yeah. Beautiful Afro. Yeah, um, she very Pam Greerish. Yeah, she was rocking it. So for, so for people listening that are fans of black exploitation films of the 60s and 70s, yeah, you're gonna like it. Very toxic. So, so I don't actually have a problem with a well done, strong female character, or, or you know, having people of different views if it feels like it fits the story and it's just not hand fisted. Given that it was set in the '60s and all the political turmoil that was going on, did it feel like what they did fit in the era that they were supposedly setting it? It did. It it, uh, it felt natural to the time era. Except so, for being like such a high operative in that. Well. Era. Well, yeah, because the FBI didn't even start taking females, let alone African American females, until that was the only thing mid seventies. Really yeah, so, but I mean, you can forgive a little bit for the needs of the military if, uh, or the needs of the uh, film, excuse me, if it's otherwise good. I don't. Know. Sometimes yeah, it, was, it was great, but that was the only thing where I was like, was there even women in the FBI yet? <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, what? Hoover liked to wear dresses. Does that count? <laughs> he would have fit in perfect in twenty twenty three. But, uh, I wasn't going to go there, but okay, you you stated your opinion. Um, so okay, let me ask you this: I agree, man. That's natural. You know, everything's everything's allowed here. I like uh, where we don't judge. It's slow. Oh, I take that back. Uh, Stabby and I will judge you, but it will be on whether you uh, put the pineapple on the pizza or not. Ooh, only if, I'll do pineapple on pizza, but it has to have Canadian bacon and jalapeno. That's All right, Stabby, story. are you are you going to tell him what you really think of him now that he's uh, committed such heresy? Pepperoni, black olives, and jalapeno. That that's given. That. But what I said was, however, if I'm going to have pineapple on pizza, not that I'd ever order it, someone else has to order it. But it's got to have Canadian bacon and, and jalapeno. Then it's not bad. And pineapple like, goes on the bottom of a cake. Okay. I like it. And then you turn it upside down. All right. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get her to make me sleep on the couch because then at least it'll be cool in the living room. Purple. Okay. Or maybe she kicks you. Uh, to the bedroom and she takes the couch. Okay. So yeah, too. she'll take the covers and I'll be comfortable. <laughs> okay. So the next thing modern, modern films tend to get wrong is the gun stuff. 
They don't seem to ever want to spend the money to hire a gun expert that knows what the heck they're doing. And so they get a lot of people who don't have any trigger discipline. They put the booger hook on the bang switch. Uh, they get all the details wrong. They're flagging their buddies. So on a scale of Navy to Army, where are they on their gun discipline? Uh, I'll give them uh, – I'll meet them pretty close to Army. So we'll call it Marine as a Ooh. sub level okay. of, of weapons handling. Um, but were... as far as like the accuracy of the the arms used that are that were around during that time frame, yeah, they nailed that. All right, so we used to do the as a running joke. You and I used to do on the scale of Navy to Army, but now that we've got the Space Force and their bunch of potatoes, should we like do it from Space Force to Army? Like, is that seem more fair? Because I feel like by putting Navy at the bottom or on the one end, we're doing oh, a discredit. Navy's always at the bottom. Hey, oh. <laughs> I mean, I'm like, you know, so what does that say about the Space Force and the Air Force? I mean, like, they've got to be on there somewhere. Well, I, I mean, you, you got to look at it like like siblings, right? They're they're the baby. They're brand new. So, yeah, right. they catch right. all the crap. Okay. So, yeah, we'll so, do Space so Force to, to Army. All right, so we did the trailer. We talked about the guns. We talked about the the elephant in the room with the politics. Um, would you recommend this movie to just your average Joe? Did, did you think it was a good action flick? Yeah, um, it fits like not that that is even a thing anymore. But everybody knows who Indiana Jones is, right? They've seen at least one of the dang movies because it's on TV at any point during the day around the around the globe. So like. But it fits, and this is what's been great about the entire franchise, is that even the sequels, you don't have to watch them all to jump right in and enjoy an Indiana Jones movie. You know, it, it sets it up. This is They set up Indy every movie. This is who he is, and this is what he's about. All right, cool. So you can throw him in any situation where he's dealing with, you know, dimensional beings, where he's dealing with time travel, where he's oh, dealing my. with... Uh, yeah, well, we won't talk about that. That's a spoiler that everybody needs to suffer through. Um, or he's dealing with the Ark of the Covenant, or he's dealing with the Holy Grail. You know, um, they all each have their own individual unique MacGuffins that drive the story. Mm -hmm. And anybody can just jump into it and follow along and not spend two hours asking questions. You know, so I think it, it nailed all the marks there as a as a standalone movie, but it's also part of a franchise. Um, it's enjoyable. It's fun. It's witty. It was well written. It was well shot. It was well directed. I mean, um, it'll never get an Academy Award because it's an Indiana Jones movie, but it should because everything was like as close to perfect as you can get it for an action adventure movie. And you still have the family aspect. And then you have the family aspect too, because he always has family. In Whether it's a everybody. surrogate one or his his biological one, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, there's there's a lot of callbacks yep. to the to the previous movies. Yep. Um, really, a lot to uh, Raiders. I thought there was a lot to Raiders. Thinking. There was a little bit for um, Crystal Skull. There was a couple things where they they kind of brought it in, and you kind of had that little nostalgia of. Eh. Which is not my favorite indie movie, but it's it's still an enjoyable one. I love that one. Yeah, okay. Well, I like right. Temple of Doom. That's my favorite. It's not going to be grounds for divorce or nothing, but I'm just saying you're wrong. Well, hmm. he winds up in Area 51, gets blown to bits. In an old lead. Uh, in an old lead refrigerator. We might have to do a whole Indiana Jones franchise review. And just just throwing that out there. That we was will. We will. Um, and while you try not to get stabbed by Stabby, we're going to take a moment. And we're going to play the commercial for that uh, zombie anthology that includes our story inspired by Florida. The government underestimated the outbreak. The best medicines couldn't stop it. Now, the dead are walking the streets, and they're hungry. Zombie Patient Zero is nine tales of flesh-ripping, brain-splattering mayhem from Bayonet Books, the boldest name in action and horror anthologies, from deep space to luxury resorts, nowhere is safe. Zip up your hazmat suit and dare to find out how it all went wrong. 
zombie patient zero from the deranged minds that brought you contact this and storming area 51 pick up your copy today in paperback or kindle excellent job from michael gallagher putting that together for us he had a story in that era there as well um so normally, uh, for the reviews, you know, I'm just going to go through these items, but we would talk about the movie trailer, or excuse me, the, the movie poster, but all the movie posters literally just have a picture of Indy on them, so I don't know if they really tell us anything other than it's an Indiana Jones movie. Yeah. But they don't really do more than that, and so let me show you. This was one of them, for instance, where it's literally Indiana Jones with his iconic leather coat and, and fedora. I think that's a fedora, right? Yeah, it's a fedora. Okay. So I don't know that that tells us a whole lot other than... Indiana Jones, although I guess that's kind of the goal. Um, you you notice, like, you have to zoom in, and I'll do that real quick. Like, you have to zoom in to even read the subplot. Yeah. Or subtitle. Really it's it's Indiana Jones. He's going to get – he's going on an adventure. Yay. He's going on an adventure. All Maybe right. Go back to um, – and, of course, I just lost the name of the town. Um, over by Morocco. It's not Morocco, but – Oh, um – Great. I hate it when you have a brain dump because then my brain doesn't can't track it. Um, Calcutta? No, it wouldn't be Calcutta. No. Start with a T. Uh, I'll have to get back to Tangiers. You Tangiers. There you go. Yeah, we Tangiers. Went back to Tangiers. Okay. That's, that's the town in the background, so it kind of gives you a little bit of him, you know, now aged, but then also a little flashback because he goes back to Tangiers. So what other characters besides Indy, his dad would be dead at this point in the 60s. Yes, um, and Marcus is also passed. Which one was Marcus? Uh, he was the uh, curator for the museum at the University yeah, he of Chicago. In Chicago. Uh, but he doesn't live in Chicago anymore in this one. He, he moved to New York. He lives in the Bronx or Brooklyn. With uh, his wife. Yeah, well, Marion. Marion. Marion Ravenwood. <laughs> Okay. Well, that's not really a thing. They got married the, at uh, at the end of Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Yeah. So that's not really a spoiler. No, that's why I said it the way that I said it. Okay. Because other parts a spoiler, and we don't do spoilers, darling. Mrs. Nope. Dr. Henry Jones Jr. <laughs> so uh, any other flashback characters for, like, just the uh, old time sake that were in this movie? Um, Sala. Sala's back. Mm -hmm. And, um... um Everybody's uh, favorite orphan rescuer, uh, Pedro Pascal, he's in it. The taxi driver? Uh, Is he no. the taxi driver? Was he the character that played the taxi driver with the blocks he, on his feet? No, uh, that's uh, that was uh, Short Round. He, I was really hoping that he was going to make a, a cameo in it. Like nope, they go to Beijing or something like that. We got a new kid. So we got some new kid. Um, he, was pretty, he was pretty cool, though. He was all right. He did a good job. He was all right. Couldn't swim. Yeah, you'll come to find out that most Egyptians can't. <laughs> okay. I mean, by the end, but... No, it was good. Uh, I'll, I'll have to do my uh, my last drive-in impersonation here. And like, all right, let's break it down. Zero nudity. 2,000 dead Germans. <laughs> Whip foo. Golf cart foo. Bubble gum foo. Bubble gum foo. Time travel foo. Time travel foo. Uh, World War II German bomber foo. Crash plane or crash train and crash plane foo. Alchemedes spear foo. What about the dirigibles? Dirigible foo. Greek fire foo. Okay. Okay. You're selling me. Keep going. Yeah, it's oh. Joe Bob says there was so much into it. Yes, definitely. You guys need to see it because four out of four stars. Four Nick Garber says check it out. It's, okay. it was, it's so good. Like it takes you. It runs the gamut. It, it really does. It takes you into the the present and future of Indy, but it also kind of rolls you back into his past, and then it rolls you past his past. Yeah. To a point where you're sitting there like, well, shit. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot of that going on there. Like, well, crap. And there was a lot of uh, callbacks where it's like, man, I, 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 they were so minuscule. They were so unique to certain parts of the other movies within the saga. That you're like, oh crap! I gotta go back and watch that. Yeah. So a lot of nostalgia in it. It was a good. I, I would like to say it was a probably one of the best send offs you can do for an iconic character such as Indiana Jones. 
and okay. uh, still kind of leave it open in case you know the next generation Harrison gets a wild hair up his butt when he's like 90 to do another one <laughs> so how do you how would you rate the dialogue in this movie sometimes action adventure movies can be cheesy and sometimes it's just the right level of panache and, and you know I, it, I think it was really good and what I really liked is that like Indiana Jones because he's in his shit, he was in his 30s when the first one started so he's got to be 70 or 80 years old you know movie time wise um he's very get off my lawn he's a very Turn good music is it clint eastwood is gran torino levels of get off my lawn or yeah, yeah close enough it's like the loud music. like he had hippies living next door to him that were starting they had parties going on throughout the night and that's what wakes him up at the beginning of the movies 8 a.m like 8 a.m with a baseball bat Turn off the music. And he's got his cub. He's got like this vintage. Well, I guess it wouldn't be vintage for the time. It'd be current for the time. But he has. He's got his Cubs baseball T-shirt on, and it's not even all the way on. It's like hunched up on his back. It's rolled. You know, because he didn't put it. He didn't straighten it out. He's beating on the door with a bat. He's like, hey. And they're like, hey, Doctor Jones, is it too loud? And he's like, yeah, it's too loud. And he's like, oh well, I'll try to fix that. And then he goes back and he. You know, he's getting ready for his morning, go teach. And then uh, he's making his coffee and it's Folgers instant coffee. So puts a couple of scoops in, has the boiling water, pours it in. And then you see him grab the hooch and do like a nice nine second pour into that thing. I still can't look at Folgers instant coffee the same way after the Folgers dips. Oh, yeah. I, I've never recovered. I just can't. I can't do it. I can't do it. Can't do it, boss. I do Folgers, <laughs> but I threw it on pop. <laughs> yeah, did you guys did you Rangers do the Folgers dip? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, the the coffee packets. The instant coffee straight in your gum so it goes the caffeine goes straight to your bloodstream. Yeah, that didn't really work. I think that's an old wives tale. We did it anyway and it seemed to keep us awake. So I'll that, take uh, it. Tabasco sauce in your eye when you're uh it's three AM and you're in a patrol base and it's not the priorities of work haven't been met yet. You can't get no rack time. I never did that. I wasn't stupid enough to do that. But oh, I'm telling you that. That's stupidity. The it's desperation. <laughs> true. But I'm just telling you the caffeine, act, like your gums are very absorbent. That's why you put tobacco there. So if you put the instant coffee, it basically, your saliva makes coffee out of it. And it does suck in if you just leave it there. We it had a genetic that uh, put it in a different way. Was he Navy? I'm just going to say no, that. He, he was Army. Hey. He, was a, he was a Ranger medic, but he knew a lot about the... Uh, the lower intestinal system, he goes, oh, this is going to absorb in half the time. And he, so I'm just saying, if, if the aliens came and took him, he's going to enjoy the trip, is what you're telling me. Yeah. They're going to probe him, they're going to get coffee, and he's going to have an orgasm. I was trying to be vague, but we'll go with it. So they're when they're in ahead. the 60s, how believe I should have known better, Nick. When they were in the 60s, how believable was like the, the hippie dialogue? Uh... I think it was more modern than it, it was. It really was more modern. You didn't get the jive talk much. You know, they it was their version of hippie talk, so everything was like, yeah, man. You know. So stoner talk more than hippie yeah. talk. That, was, more, I think that was, was the guys next door, but everybody else was like either um, a Nazi agent or an American agent. So or a British agent. Or a British agent. So they were all talking very, you know, straightforward. We have work to do. Um, yeah they they nailed the um the one thing that i will say is they they nailed the costumes the yeah. wardrobe they nailed yeah, the wardrobe it. Is... every single person down to the receptionist at the college he's working at like her her shoes were even the right era it was very late was, 60s i was just sitting yeah. there like whoever the wardrobe uh director was they nailed every single part of it when you're in new york and all of the astronauts just landed and they're doing the, the big astronaut parade um all the cars were correct and then you have them you know fly over to tangiers and all of their clothes are correct they wind up on a boat in the middle of the ocean the diving suits were correct the diving equipment yeah it was it was so well thought out each part of it that it was like you probably could have messed up the dialogue and they're they're just yeah everything but, else about it was just so perfect even that i don't i don't think it took away from the experience of the film mm -hmm. at all um 
It was a fun movie. It's everything you expect from an indie an indie film from Indiana Jones. You know, it was. So, so we're going to do a little bit of a side sidebar. So right. since you mentioned the Brits, I will say that there's been an incident that's floating around the U.S. Army WTF uh, Twitter page uh, called it. Uh, apparently, they did joint operation training here in the states, and maybe allegedly, possibly a GI liberated their flag. Um, they said guide on in the text that's floating around, but I don't think the Brits have guide on, so probably just the unit crest or unit flag. They have regimental colors. Yeah, but uh, I just disappeared. And so I forgot I wasn't on a personal page when I responded to that. And I'm like, just if you've got it, visit Boston, leave it in the harbor, tell them you're having a tea party. So sorry, not sorry, but I'm just saying hats off to that person. Promote above peers. We're here for you. Above center mass, promote above peers. At least that's how they rated on the uh, on the officer's shit. Yeah, the um, yeah center mass above center mass below center mass. And it's also possible they were hanging out with some of the same Marines I knew. Gear adrift is a gift. Yep, man. They wanted it that badly they would have secured it. That's right. They would have locked it so, down like we do our guide ons. Yeah, we we actually I think we've told this story on here before, but like we liberated them. and cable on the eyelet of the guide on. That's that'll keep yes. Away. We liberated a Marine Corps guide on at Alta Kundum when we were there, so we kept our tow bars like uh, combat loaded. So basically, they're hooked up like we're ready to go on the on our gun trucks, and then ratcheted strapped up. So if something ever happens, you just grab your K bar, cut the the ratchet strap, and it's boom, you're ready to go in under five seconds. Uh, in Iraq, when I was there, they had the Marines sleeping in tents without overhead protection, and I made friends with one of them, and uh, they called it kidnapping. I called it extraction and liberation, defecting, whatever. Um, we had a spare bunk in, in our barracks, and I gave it to him. So for like three weeks, they counted him as MIA, which was weird because he showed up for his duty. They just He didn't report to his rack in the tent city. He just went back to our barracks. Nice. So we um, we did a lot of resupply. I was part of the um, convoy groups that were resupplying the Marines for the Second Battle of Fallujah. So I made some friends with the Jarheads. Um, and uh, so it was kind of a little bit of a rivalry when we were out to, at Tecundum with the air, the Marine Air Wing. So they decided they needed some tow bars. We had them combat ready to go because we were ready to roll out at a moment's notice. One thing people don't realize is when you're gun tracks, your QRF, once you get on base, if they call, you go. It doesn't matter if you just got off the road, if you're tired. I mean, nobody's drunk because it's, you know, dry country in theory. Um, number one, yeah. Right, right. General rule one alpha. No booze, no um, poon. Right. <laughs> but uh, so they liberated our guide, our, our, um, our tow bars and we wanted it back. And that's when I heard a Marine snidely tell me gear adrift is a gift. So we scoped out their talk and uh, their tactical operations center uh, and their security fell asleep. I guess it was a long day and his guide on was just right there. It's like it said Sergeant Handley on it or something. So we it went was calling out to me. It was calling out to me. It's like. Handley, oh Handley! If you get the reference to that, it's from a movie from the '90s, um, Hollywood, oh Hollywood. Um, it's it's the mannequin. If you don't know, it's got the. We'll talk. It's a good movie too, but it's actually alien or like statues come alive. I guess that's even spec fic. We'll, we could do it. I used to watch that movie on repeat religiously for like. Oh God, James. we just watched it last year. Mannequin? Yeah. So I watched it. When you watch it, you feel uh, you feel for like the younger guy that's like. We watched it last year. Okay. What's well, on the list we can root? But when you watch it the first time when you're younger and you're rooting for the guy who's working the night shift, just trying to grind, the older I get, the more that security guard, I can relate to him. Like he just wants to do his crap and go and home. home. And, and they just keep messing with him and his poor little bulldog. What was the Kim Cattrall? That was the one who played the mannequin. She was so hot. She still Yeah, hot. she was. Uh, if, if you know, you know, right. But so anyway, so we took the guide on and then we, we wanted to trade. And so once they gave us back our tow bars, miraculously, we returned the guide on, but we couldn't just give it back because that'd just be so low class. Yeah, you got a barter. So what we did is we tied it That's to a string and we opened the porta potty and we just draped it in the, in the, just above the blue goo and we let them go get it. Like, I mean, so it was just, it was a message. We didn't desecrate it, but it was just, you know, the, the message was sent. Yeah, Don't you, mess had, with us. you had to smell stinky shit to get your guide on back. Right. Uh, so, yeah, so uh, just a tangent when you mentioned the Brits, I'm just saying that like some of that, that red coat British rivalry still exists, and I'm here for it. Yeah, I almost caused a bar fight in, uh, in Sinai, Egypt. 
They probably uh, had it coming. No, well, I didn't. I didn't know the rules of their bar. We went to a British bar that was on post. They had their own bar, and uh, once again, I got linked up with the Brits. They thought I was cool. They're like, "Hey, why don't you come to the bar tonight?" And we're like, "All right, cool." So we go to the bar. We're drinking. Um, I I was a beer guy at the time, so I was just drinking like Guinness and whatever. Can you stomach their weird warm beer? Like their obsession with not being They're, cold. They've gotten a. This particular group liked it cold. So thank God that was. That was old hat for me. I'm used to cold beer. Yep. So I was drinking a couple of beers, and then of course one of the one of the limeys. I'm sorry, British. Um, wanted to start doing shots. And they do shots of gin. Oh. You know, like or real. Uh, uh, beef eaters. I think it was, or uh, what's the other one? Blue Sapphire. Mm -hmm. That's another British one. So they're doing shots, and apparently. They, they brought out the royal glasses. So there's the crown on the bottom of the shot glass. So it's very, it's a big faux pas. We, if you, like most Americans do, when they do a shot, they slam it down face down with the end sticking up. Well, if you do that in British culture, it means F the queen. So I do my shot and slam that thing down like I was playing dominoes. Because you got to show but, that it's empty. Yeah. And... Like I heard a record scratch, like people are like shipping back from their chairs, <laughs> their tables, you know, and they're like, you remember, you know what you read. And I'm like, I need a translator because we're two people separated by a common language. <laughs> so um, the, the, the very young cherry lieutenant who just got out of SAS selection pulls me aside. I was like, yeah, mate, uh, that means F the queen. I'm like, oh, that's not what I meant at all. That's just how we do it in the States. <laughs> but uh, for a good you 30 do... seconds there, I thought I was going to get uh, hung from a yard arm. So I'm just saying your your uh, British accent was a little bit more Dundee and a little bit less London-y. Um, so... Well, I mean, you got Cockney accents too, which does, I mean, let's face it, Australia was a prison camp. So True, true. So that's almost like, you know, a higher pitched version of, of British English, I guess. Boy. <laughs> so anyway, so that was I mean, a tangent. This way, like mm, the colonials are getting rowdy. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I have it on good authority from from Gemma Cloutworthy, one of our favorite Brits who we interview uh, periodically. Uh, that all of England, all of the United Kingdom is London. It doesn't matter. It's North London, yeah. North North London. That's you know, it. it's, it's all That's London. It. Uh, all of it. Yeah. It's yeah, it's the whole London. island. It's it's all London. Manchester. It's all London. So, although I will say, I do actually know where the term beef eater comes from, which I think is kind of cool. It's the name of the unit that's the, the, the Tower of London guards. They call them beef yeah, eaters. They got the big beef. Well, not beef. They got it was the big also beef. back in the day, they were the only ones because they were fed well in, when the average poor person was not having beef on a regular basis. Yeah, they were having, uh, what's that stuff with lamb? It's like a stew. Mutton? Mutton, yeah. Yeah. So, so anyway, that's our little bit of um, random musing because you guys said you like those side trails. So we'll get us back on track. All right. So you right. mentioned the characters. Um, tell us about the the new character that they introduced, uh, Indy's goddaughter. What did you think of her? What was her name? Do you remember? I don't remember her name. That is not a good sign. That is not a good sign. But uh, she she comes into the movie as you know um, one of Indy's the daughter of Indy's best friend during World War II, who was British. He was also an archaeologist. He was also part of joint operations between the um, OSS and uh, British intelligence. Um, kind of like, uh, what's that movie? Helena. Oh, Helena. Helena Schoen. And it was uh, played by Phoebe Waller-Bridge is the name of the actress. Yes. Yes. Um, she comes in like she's going to be like this, uh, well, not a scoundrel. And she ends up being a scoundrel. She comes in like she's trying to finish her father's work. Yeah, on, very noble intentions on, on the dial. The dial that she wanted to finish her his dissertation for him because he passed. Yeah. And it turns out that is not why she wanted it at all. She wanted a hawk it in Tangiers. <laughs> for a lot of money. For a lot of money. So and that's where that um the Egyptian boy her her version of uh, short round mm -hmm. came in the picture. Came in the picture. He's like a pickpocket. But also her Egyptian. ex fiance causes the entire road rage um, car chase, yeah. which was very indie. That whole 
car chase was very indie. He was people like a Saudi were, prince or something like people that. People were bouncing back and forth between cars. They were running into fruit carts. Like, it was as Indiana Jones as, as a car chase could yeah, be. Yeah, I mean, a car chase with automobiles versus golf carts. And the golf carts won. And the golf carts won. With gum. With gum. Yeah, with gum. Put it back together with bubble gum. So a little no, bit of MacGyver then. Yeah, 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 there was, there was They kept going, it's stuff. not going to work. It's not going to work. And Indy's like, watch this. Hold my beer. <laughs> yeah, um, if a 70-year-old man says it's going to work, it's probably going to work because he's got experience in that. So do you think uh, Helen Shaw, the character, is a worthy successor to Indy that they could build a franchise around? No, no. absolutely not. Fran Indy's Indy. You can't do it with anybody else. No, if I was going to bring anybody in, like, God forbid, you know, Indy passes eventually well they they tried to set it up for him to have a son but well, we know what happened there yeah spoilers darling he but, killed him uh, on a uh, star destroyer wait wrong franchise wrong franchise isn't it though because we're pretty sure we're convinced that the indiana, indiana jones, jones adventures are han solo's dreams when he was frozen in carbonite i.e club obi-wan Okay, okay. Uh, or the hieroglyphics with uh, R2 and C3PO, C3PO on the uh, Ark of the Covenant. Just saying, there's a lot going on in Indy that makes you think that it's just Han Solo's dreams. Okay, all right. I could buy that. I could buy it. So, all right. So, we talked about the characters. You don't think she's she's ready for prime time yet? You don't I, think I, she don't, can I don't think it's that. It's just, I don't think they were setting it up for that. Okay. No, like, they, the, they, the setup wasn't there. Um, there's a lot. It could like, have been there if she stuck to the way she was at the beginning of the movie. Yeah. If they stuck with that personality trait, then she definitely could have taken over one day. But because she turned into this money hungry, we're going to just sell the artifacts type person, it really put her kind of in between an indie and a villain. So she just. And so then, she was like the Diet Coke of evil. Yeah, pretty much. Like a Pepsi Zero type. Okay. Yeah. So what do you think of the overall plot arc? What can you tell us without spoilers and then give your opinion on it? Ooh, that's a toughie. Without spoilers. Okay, so um, obviously the Dial of Destiny is about time travel. That's so spoiler. Nope. It's nope. spoiler. Nope. Any history major knows what that is. And you're talking about Archimedes, so come on. Anyway, he was a mathematician. That is not a spoiler. That's historical fact. <laughs> I know that. But if you look deeper into his work, you see that his math also leads into time travel. Uh, it leads into quantum theory. I don't, I wouldn't call it time travel. Anyways, um, so there's that. Which is Yes, I've read a book, audience. Awesome. I know, shocker. <laughs> which is awesome to think about the fact they're they're playing with the past and the future all together in one um on the family aspect it's rocky there's ups and there's downs and and you'll know once you watch the movie because anything else i say is a spoiler definitely i love solo i love that they brought solo back yeah he was always my favorite indie side character <laughs> and all his kids and all of his kids <laughs> well now it's he's got a tribe of grandkids yes you know that probably great grandkids because they, yeah. they had to go get ice cream down I, the i'm not used to a skinny solo I'm not used was, to that. It was definitely off, yeah. yeah. Why was why was that off for you? Because Sala was he always like a big teddy bear. Yeah, he was very. Uh, I wouldn't say portly, but he was thick. You wanted to give him a big squishy yeah. hug, like he would give you great hugs. He's the Renee. So he's the kind of guy with the pocket worthers for you. I always thought that of him. He wants to be the one to have a snack. Yeah, yeah, he always had this on board. Yeah. He's got the caramels in his pocket to <laughs> get the little kids. You know what I'm about with Stella, the the Egyptian guy from like yeah, the yeah. Whole franchise. Fez. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, Will Fez had like a tribe of kids. You know, um, it was he just always, weird. He oh, always reminded me of those those old those older people at church who always had like the Werther's mint or original caramel candies yeah. to give you as you're like being good at church. Yeah. yeah, always. Has and he always and he could always pick out a bad date. Yeah. But now he's, so, he's a bit better, but he still takes you out for ice cream, so that's cool. Yeah. Can't go wrong with ice cream. There's a lot of nostalgia think. in the movie, and I think that was the one thing that really got me. There was a Let's, lot of 
nostalgia. A lot of it seems to be a trend in Hollywood. They're they're leaning into the nostalgia, trying to get the nostalgia bucks, which is like I get it to a point, but that's not how you build new franchises. Well, not even just indie nostalgia, just worldly nostalgia, because they brought in a they were. Like they they really focused for a solid like 15, 20 minutes of the movie. They they kept circling back to the fact that Buzz Aldrin and uh, oh yeah and, the uh, uh, Neil the Armstrong mission. and everybody was coming back, and they were really drilling in the fact that you know we went to the moon and we came back from the moon, and here's these guys and they're in this parade, and they they did a great job on them too. Like if you weren't paying close enough attention, you'd legit think that they were using old reels from the actual parade they probably were so some of them it, it was wild and then you like the kids you know um because that was the time where like it just sparked imagination in young people yeah. like he was on he was on the metro like a subway yeah. on the l and uh there was a couple of kids in there and they're all wearing that like space helmet that they used to sell at thrift shops like during that time you know, so you know it's the it was a lot of the age knowledge. of innovation, and you mm -hmm. know, kids were all into it. You know, it was it it was very fitting to the movie and the time period. And even though it was taking place in the sixties, it, it so did they hit story at all? It didn't no. take away from it what kept you in is. it kept you in the adventure, but then it also and the action, but then it also had moments where you kind of sat back and you were like, oh man, do you remember those? Do you remember those? So did it hit into the politics of the day? So the draft, well, were there draft riots yet this early in this in the Vietnam War? Yeah, there, were, uh, there were, but it didn't really mention them. Um, there's a, a spoiler that we're kind of avoiding here. Yes. Um, because it does. Affect. It affects India, and we'll just call it the, uh, you know, because of the Vietnam War. So you're telling me Ho Chi Minh was using the dial of destiny to uh, to dig those holes? No. Yeah. Okay. Actually, that would have been fun too, though. That would have been pretty fun. Like I said, he's dealing with Nazis again or Nazi relics. No, okay. there was a life changing event in Indy's family. Family, thanks to Vietnam. The Vietnam War, yeah. Okay. And that's the only thing that they really touch on. And we're both choosing our words very wisely here because. Yeah, it, cause that, it, that hit us pretty hard. It did. It, it, it. We both kind of looked over at each other like, oh, fuck. It's like, how are they going to explain this one character's absence from the movie? And uh, that's what it well, was. Well, two of them, because we didn't get Marianne back till the very end. But... No, we knew she was going to show up, though. But also remember when we when we got that spoiler, um, we saw the other thing on the fridge, remember? Yeah. Yeah. So... There, it's it's two minutes. It's two minutes, but it's it kind of like it hits you in the feels really hard for a split second. You stop smiling because you're watching an indie movie, and you go, "Fuck." Well, I mean, to sum up the movie and his indie's motivations is that his life is going to crap. He's getting ready to retire. His wife is leaving him. Hey, you weren't supposed to tell that part. <laughs> I didn't give the big spoiler away. I will though. Um, no, you won't. Come on. So, no so he's got a lot of stuff happening to his life. And the only reason he's really on this adventure is to stop the dial from getting in the hands of the wrong people. But the closer he gets to it, he's thinking, maybe I can change something. You know? Until the big climax. And Until the big climax. Much. And you find out what the, the whole part, why, why the dial was invented. And it's only good for one use. You know, a very specific, a very specific use, but it does bring up the, some interesting paradoxes that happen with time travel. I've heard it called the Kennedy or the uh, the Lincoln paradox, where basically if you had time travel, so you use it, you go back in time and you stop the assassination. So there was no assassination, which meant you never had to go back because there was nothing to undo. So you didn't yeah. go back. So it happens, and you create the loop. Yeah, you create the remnant. Yeah. So does it touch on any of those paradoxes that time travel is fun to think about? No, they save it towards the end. The very, towards the end with the big thing, the, the, the big point of it all um, that we're, we're desperately trying to avoid. Um, it, I don't think we're doing a very good job. But. It's a, it's for a very specific thing. Like it only goes, it, it only, only goes to a specific point in time. goes to a specific point in time. 
It's not any time. It's a very specific time. So um, there's no, let me go back and save this person. Let me go back and save that person. It's, it's you only go here and nowhere else. Yeah, the dial only takes you to one place at one point in time. For a very specific reason. For a very reason. specific fucking reason. I'm sorry. Try to keep it family. I, I specific freaking reason. French toast. French toast. So how do you think the world building went? Obviously, with uh, with the movie, you know, it's all visual for the world building, or mostly. But uh, what, was it easy to in, imagine yourself in the eras that they depicted? Like, what did you think of the, the world building? Uh, I thought it was really good. Yeah. I, I think it was pretty... Uh, immersive in each time frame time period that they uh they depicted in the movie because um, you go back and forth between world war ii and their present which was the 60s um and then alchemy's time but uh it was it was mainly four major time or four major worlds so you you had the world of them back in time with the nazis that's okay so leading yeah, you up to them um, you have New York, the sixties, you have Tangiers, which is in the sixties. It was in the sixties, but it was totally different than how it is. Oh, in you're, York. Talking, you're talking worldwide. Yeah. Um, just, just the world itself was very different there versus how it is. I would say each geographical York. location and then you have you know, accurate for the time period in which they were depicting. Yes. And then they put you into that final one and that one definitely everything was dead on the costumes the buildings it was believable it was it, it really sucked you into it because one second you're here and next second you're here and you're like okay we're doing this now cool so speaking of sucking you in how did you um think of the cinematography like so the way the films were shot the camera angles jump cuts that sort of thing oh it was beautifully shot gorgeous yeah it was it was a well uh the director of photography did a great job and the director did a great job. Um, the scenery was everything you would expect from an Indiana Jones movie. Yeah. It was epic and beautiful and glorious. Even, even Tangiers and Tangiers is a shithole. <laughs> so they, they made Tangiers look exotic, you know, like, yeah. it's like, Oh man, I'd like to go there and, you know, drink gin and play with pirates. So I think, all the shot setup. Somebody definitely read the five C's of cinematography. The the angles were well placed, even in shots that um, or scenes that weren't meant to be dynamic. They were still set up that way. So you had you had some great shot placement going on there. Um, every scene was entertaining, yeah. even even if it wasn't like even if the dialogue was boring, um, the scene setup was good. The shots were set up well. So, um, you know, if I was a, uh, a professor at USC film school or NYU film school, I'd give it a, like a, nah, I'd, I'll give it a 10 out of 10. I, I, I think 10 it was well 10. shot. It was gorgeous I, everywhere. To be honest, it's almost a master class in cinematography. Because when, really when they really wanted Indy to be the center of attention, they had the camera aiming up at him. So he was... He appeared to be the tallest yeah, person they, there. Yeah, like larger than life. Larger than life. And then when they were like, so the man was the legend in yeah. some of those shots. And then when they were, you know, concentrating on the younger kids or some of the smaller characters, they were aiming more down at them, so they looked smaller than probably they really are. And, as well as knowing that they're they were smaller. And every them. time a bad guy showed up on screen, you knew he was a bad guy. Yes. Just based on the shot placement, and wardrobe, and all that stuff, and and some of the makeup, the special effects makeup, the silk shirts were something else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was. I think the car chase was my favorite. Was it the car chase? I think the car chase in Tangiers was my favorite. My absolute favorite. Everything Tang about Tangiers it, was definitely my fa my favorite uh, group of. Scenes. Everything about that car chase said screamed Indiana Jones. Uh no! When he was climbing up, when they went inside the. Uh, that cavern. Oh, climb up. Yes, yeah, climb my up. Knees. Yeah, and he's my complaining knees. about all the all of his ailments because he's a seven year old man doing this stuff. He's like, just just get ahead of me. It's fine. I just, I just need a break. Just give me a minute. My just knees are not what they used to be. You know, I think that was my favorite scene. <laughs> no, that was that was a great scene. But there's something about a good old fashioned car chase with Indy that just 
Well, you gotta have it. Whether it's a a, it. a Rick a cart, a Rick the cart, or whatever those things are, rickshaws. Yeah, the rickshaw carts from like Temple of Doom, and yeah, th this is on par with everything that makes you love Indiana Jones movies. Yeah. So it's just it's an extension of. of Even the get films. him chasing his hat. Yeah, you gotta you gotta have the hat grab where he loses it. He loses it. And he's gotta find it. Yeah, even if it's hanging out to dry on a on a curtain. <laughs> So, yeah, it was okay. a great movie. I, 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 I went in there with very low expectations because I was very disappointed in uh, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull um, on the first viewing. I've watched it several times since then. It's, it's, not, it's not the best Indiana Jones movie, but it, it's still an Indiana Jones movie after multiple watches. I, I, I keep going in with a new approach. Uh, eventually, I just went in there having zero expectations of it. Um, Dial of Destiny, I don't think I really need to do that. I could have gone in there with high expectations and still walked away satisfied. That was such a good movie. So Okay. So overall, what were your thoughts on it and what would you rate it on a scale of one to five? Five. Five stars. Okay. It's a five. I loved it. I loved everything about it. I I'm I'm already a sucker, you know, for indie for action movies like that. I love the whole aesthetic of it and it just it gave everything you expect when you go to see an indie movie like yeah it was perfect yeah um i was raised by my you know not by my grandfather but like when i visit my grandfather make me watch the old like 1930s serials right you know, serials um and that's what it feels like to me i was entertained um i was on the edge of my seat on on some portions of the film you know, uh, I think in the end, Ranger Nick gives it four and a half stars. Nick says, check it out. So uh, when you say on the edge of your seat, was that because, you know, you're about to be asked to go adjust the rabbit ears or just that? Yeah, intent? yeah a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. Uh, I would just say that the uh, the action um, was really was really well done, um, even though, I, you know, Indiana Jones is going to make it out of there. He's going to he's going to finish the fight. He's going to pull through. There's parts where you're like, oh man, he may not escape this one. Like the scuba diving scene. Does it um, feel like there's going to be another one or does it feel like a proper send off? Uh, it, it felt more 90% proper send off, but they're, they, they left, left it, open. it open just in case. And this is the spoiler I can give. Um, he's got his fedora hanging out. It's clipped on a, on a clothesline in between the buildings in New York, drying off because that thing got wet throughout the movie. The whole movie. Um, the whole movie. It was just <laughs> constantly wet. Um, and then it did the... Uh, the old school the, closing. The old closing rabbit hole. You know, so it goes black and it focuses on a central subject. And that's what it did. It did it to the fedora and you think it was going to end there. And then you see Andy's hand come out and grab it. So, nice. I, for me, I interpret that as... I'll be back. <laughs> I'll be back. There's, there's another adventure going on. Uh, possibly in the near future. I guess, shit, the next one, it would have to be in his 1970s or 80s because he's got to be dead by 1990, you know, because he was born in like 1897 or something like that. So okay. they, they left it open for one more. Um, I don't, if they have OCD like I do, I, I couldn't leave a franchise on new, movie number five, <laughs> you know. So I just did a quick Google search. Henry Walton Jones Jr., a.k.a. Indiana Jones, uh, was born in Princeton, New Jersey on July 1st, 1899. Okay. So in this movie, if it's set in the 60s, he's whatever the year is plus one. Okay. Yeah, I think it was, uh, when was the moon landing? 1968. So. 68, 69. I hear it was talking. 1969, so he would have been 69. He's been 70 years old. July yeah. 16th, I think, or 15th, something like that. So, yeah, it's almost, the summer. Yeah, almost exactly um, 70 years to the day, roughly, his character would have been. When you see him climbing out of his lazy boy chair, that definitely tracks. Which is sad because I'm in my 40s and that's how I get out of the lazy boy. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, we might be chronologically 40s, but. Physically, I mean, the army rode us hard and put us away wet a few yeah. times. Yeah, and I have to say that whatever I feel, Indy's probably feeling it just a little bit more based on you know watching his movies. 
you know, in the ventures. Yeah, yeah. So it's that old meme. It's like this guy that's like clearly uh, in his 80s, and he goes, what are you talking about? The Marine Corps or the Army insert service here ages you. I don't feel a day over 21. I don't feel a day over 21. And the guy looks like he's 80. Oh, yeah. Like, I should be walking with a cane, but I don't. Yeah, the VA gives me one. I'm, I'm getting better and better about not needing it. But I do remember, so there was uh, one of the guys that was at the Hampton VA at the time I got back and done with Walter Reed. And every day I walk, I, I can stick it to the man because they said that might not happen again. But there was a guy that was one of the second class of the Tuskegee Airmen that was a greeter at the Hampton VA. And he always wore, as an older black gentleman, he always wore a purple pinstripe suit with the purple fedora with the black uh, lace trim. And he had one of those like, black wooden mahogany canes with like the golden grip that's a tip and when they, the va first gave me the cane he's like son you got to get a cane you got to get a pimp cane and it was like he might have left the 60s but the 60s never left him never left him he's over there just uh, like cool might man yeah he was he was a character but yeah every time i, I think of those kinds of scenes i'm picturing that we always like, have a person in our life that you know they were told they're never going to make it this far. You'll never walk again. You'll never do this. And and then they don't just do it. They exceed it. Uh, every I hate fuel a lot of missions in the army. Everyone has one of those people in their life. Well, like, yeah, I'm yours and you're mine. I wasn't supposed to live past 18, so. <laughs> when I shattered my leg, they told me by the age of 40, I'd be walking with a cane at best. And yeah, yeah. Here I am at. 45 years old and I can deadlift 600 pounds and I can squat 400 pounds and I don't use a cane. So they, when I got hurt, the TBI started, you know, causing, cause the, the injury with the head injury, it doesn't like the cell death doesn't just happen all at once. It's a slow no, progression where it slowly yeah. will get worse. And so you can see some of the dead spots. If you do a MRI or CAT scan, I get those two mixed up. Mostly where memory is stored long term. Yeah. Memory. But uh, so I, so I, you know, the dizziness was a thing, but oh, if you're yeah. stubborn enough, you can't overcome. Yeah. Vertigo is crazy. Yeah, um, it is. I was told from the age of seven that I'd not live past 18. And then when I hit 18, they said, okay, but because you have arthritis in your knees and your hips, you'll never pa walk past 21 and you won't live past 25. Uh, I turn 36 next week. So. Oh, that is next week. Yeah, next Wednesday. Oh. Hint, hint, birthday present shopping. I didn't get you anything for your birthday. You're, Except welcome. You're welcome. The purse, the wallet. The shoes. Oh shit! I did. The I did earrings. Get too much stuff. <laughs> My accidental Amazon purchases because you threw them in the cart and I didn't pay attention. Hey, and we went to see my Dodgers play. Yeah, and I took you to go see your Dodgers play. And they won. That's great. Okay, okay. So um, we give it a review. Uh, you you do recommend that the uh, Fort Hanley uh, does a private screening of this when it when it comes Absolutely. out. Absolutely. As soon, soon as you can get your, your grubby little hands on it, Grunt, give it a watch. Like I said, four and a half stars. Nick says, check it out. Or, or go see it in the theater. Good luck. I, mean, I don't want to break a perfect track record. I mean, you. I went out on the most epic and iconic movie score for music ever known to man. You cannot trump the music of The Last of the Mohicans. That was playing on my head every True. raid we did in country. But if you're going to come back to the movies, why not for possibly the last Indiana Jones? Now, wait till you hit your 40th anniversary and then go see a film. It won't be Indy. It probably yeah. will be Indy. That's the thing. It probably will be another <laughs> Indiana Jones movie. I think... Um... Oh, my goodness. Excuse me. Uh, I think Last of the Mohicans was, nine. I Googled it, 91. Holy crap. Okay, so. It's been 32 years. 32 years. So you got eight more years to hold out. I'll fly out. We'll go see a movie together. To It'll be like Rocky 49 or something, and they'll be I, on his. You know what? <laughs> out on a wheelchair. Is if they re-release Last of the Mohicans on that 40th, and then we could just end it where it began. Yeah. That would be kind of cool. Um, we'll be in Florida. Yeah, so I don't have to fly. We can just drive up. Yeah, Actually, we can meet halfway. I'm sure yeah. there's a good barbecue place we can stop at and make it a thing. Absolutely. I love barbecue. I like Tax food. deductible. I mean, what? Yeah. Texas stink. Cool. Taxation is theft. Um, what if I rent an old theater? Just one. Just one room. Play it. What you're saying is I'm going to rent an old theater. 
She's going to supervise. You get supervised. You, you're in charge of snacks. I am great at cooking. That's true. That's true. All right. And, and when we first met, you were threatening to stab him because of your um, made from scratch Italian something or another. Oh, so it's it getting cold. It's meatballs. It's meatballs. It's okay. Okay. All right. So you've gotten your no uh, no organizational every rabbit trail we felt like going on movie review. Uh, one of the questions we're going to ask you because we're doing those now over on Spotify is what movie you want us to review next. And uh, for the poll, um, I don't know. Nick will think of something, and then we'll write that stuff down. Uh, so don't forget to do those. They help us. I'll make a list. We watch. They help us uh, talk to you, but we, we're we're definitely game to do more classic. So by classic, we're defining it because we're old farts. Uh, 80s, 90s, or early aughts. Anything past that, I would say, is too modern for the classic retro yeah. whatever. I'm um, willing to go back to as far back as whenever Plan 9 from Outer Space was made. Space 1999, say what? what? Iconic Lost in Space. Danger, Will Robinson. Um, but yeah, we're 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 game for some of that. Dick. Yeah, and you can definitely, uh, if you want to, as a guest, say, "Hey, I'd really like to talk about this topic with you." You know, we're we're game for new things. We're having fun. We're just basically now filming. If we pick that, we'll reach out to you and try and get you on the show to talk about it with us. Absolutely. So uh, basically, we're filming all those nerdy conversations we have when no one's looking anyway, instead of following the script that was starting to bore us. So. There we go. Uh, with that being said, Nick, what are you drawing this week? Um, I got a cover for Bengali issue three. I got to finish a turnaround for the um, Atreidean universe. I think I said that right. I don't know. I um, also got some lettering I got to do. I'm also prepping it to go on a crowdfunding site on Fund My Comics. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, God, what else am I doing? Oh, I got challenged to draw the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles in the style of this other guy's choice. So I'm going to try and knock that out over the next two days. It might not be in color, but it's going to look cool. So, yeah, that's what I got going on now. Yeah. Busy, busy, busy. I'm still working on this stuff with James. Uh, oh, yeah, and uh, cover for your next book. And uh, we've got some anthologies coming out to include one with uh, – Tanks and mechs and yes. epic combat. Uh, we even have some ghost tanks and some satire from Blaine Lee Pardo of Battletech fame. Yes. Um, so we've got some good stuff coming up. Um, I'm in talks. There's a small publishing company that does anthologies that wants me to manage some and organize some for them. So Ooh, I picked some pretty cool, uh, pretty cool topics for that. Should be fun. Uh, I won't say more until everything's finalized and approved because until the dotted line is signed, uh, it's all just pipe dreams, right? You're saying um, bullshit. That's right. So with that being said, we're going to tell you how you can find us, dear listener, dear viewer. Uh, and we do appreciate all of our new viewers over on BitChute and Rumble. We, we, we appreciate you. Oh, woo! Yes. Uh, but before we let you go, we'll harken back to the old days and remind you to please be kind and speak your mind on the reviewing platforms. Your reviews help the right readers find the right books. So do your part, people. And for movies, it's not uh, Goodreads or BookBub. You can go over to, where do they rate the movies at? Rotten Tomatoes? Rotten Tomatoes is the IMDb. current site. And IMDb, the Internet Movie Database. There you go. And the podcast has a slot over there on IMDb. I don't know who put it up there, but thank you. Um, I don't know how any of that works. I didn't even yeah, realize that was a thing. Based on there. <laughs> well, you weren't at that episode. I'm pretty sure it was the guest who did it from that episode. Oh. Um, but you can find us, since there's no guests to give you their socials, at Linktree, which is L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E backslash Blasters and Blaze Podcast. Again, Linktree backslash Blasters and Blaze Podcast, where we link to everything, including our bitch shoot and rumble. Uh, we have a Twitter over at twitter.com backslash SF underscore fantasy underscore show. Sierra Foxtrot underscore fantasy underscore show. You can find us on Facebook where all the shenanigans happen over at facebook.com backslash groups backslash blasters and blaze podcast. Again, backslash groups backslash blasters and blaze podcast. We do have a Facebook page still working on getting the uh, dedicated URL, but it's there. You can look for it if you so desire. We share book reviews. We share our episodes. We share movie reviews. We share funny, silly sci-fi memes. We do the thing. We share foot sizes. I mean, it's we share everything. I mean, that was for your OnlyFans. Uh, we have a website where 
You can listen to our episodes over at anchor.fm backslash blasters, tack and tack blades. Again, anchor.fm backslash blasters, tack and tack blades, where you can support the show for as little as 99 cents a month. You can help keep the lights on. Or you can support the show more directly if you so desire, if you so choose, dear listener, dear viewer. Uh, you can do that over at buymeacoffee.com backslash author J.R. Handley. Again, buymeacoffee.com backslash author J.R. Handley, where uh, be sure to put in the comment section that it's for the podcast. And I will keep my co-host, Doc Seska and Nick Garber and his wife, Stabby Garber, uh, duly um, full Definitely. of properly made pizzas with no pineapples on top. Uh, because no that is the way the gods intended. So uh, we'll make them convert to the proper pizza religion. Um, but with that said, thank you for spending some of your precious time with us. For Nick Garber and Doc Saska, I am J.R. Hanley, and this was the Blasters and Blades podcast. We'll be back next week at the same time where we'll indulge our love of nerd culture, cheesy jokes, and all things that go boom. And with that being said, Stabby, thank you for joining us again. And I don't know if you realize this, but you've just been volunteered for more episodes. Where do you win? Oh, you've let's been voluntold. Uh, she says that now until like season seven. Let's yeah. talk horror, horror, horror sci fi. We let's actually have an episode where I'm working on getting some guests for space horror. So think Dead Space, think uh, Resident Evil would qualify, I would think. Event Horizon. Absolutely. The Abyss. The, yeah. Abyss. the Abyss. Leviathan. Yeah. Star Six. Yeah, lots of ideas. Go down that rabbit hole, my friend, all I'm, day. I'm currently playing in the uh, the best of the '90s slashers, and we started last night with uh, the Scream franchise, and we're just slowly working through the best of the '90s right now. So I'm sure plenty of other movies are going to be popping up and saying hello. <laughs> hello. So the uh, the '90s Scream franchise really got a bunch of I think it was Geico commercials where like they're being chased and they play into all the horror stereotypes and they decide to hide in the one barn. Oh, with chainsaws. Yeah, chainsaws and saws and stabby things. And the car is sitting there with the keys and he, the the killer is like, "Are these stupid? Like are the they, car's right there. Like I can see you." Or, or the other one is the uh, the stereotypical the the because it's comedy where the black guy is runs off to his own so they can kill him first. I don't know if that was ever intended, but it's become such a trope. It is a trope. They break they break it now. They're, they, they're trying to get away they from. They brought it, it up in. Um, but they bring it up. Scream number three. No two. Yeah, but it's, Scream is a parody franchise, so they're you know it makes sense. First, they, the the cameraman makes a joke about the fact that yeah, he didn't he didn't know about that, but the actor in Hollywood in Scream Three literally says, "Don't you know what happens to brothers like me in scary movies?" Oh yeah, when they're making and then the other turns others. around and runs away. Yeah, the, the stab. <laughs> when they have the parody um, movie within the movie that's based on the movie's real events. Yeah, yeah. and I, I really really appreciate the movies that don't take themselves too seriously. Yeah, no, that's so that's so nonsense. Those are the fun. I ones. love when he trips. He's the clumsiest slasher. Oh, yeah. And it's always a different killer. I love it. And they're all clumsy as shit. He fell down the stairs last night. <laughs> all right. And with that being said, I am going to hit the exit button, people. Thank you for sticking with us. And uh, we'll see you next um, later this week.